Welcome to the Title IX at 50 Educate and Advocate webcast. My name is Kathy Mangano, and I am speaking today with Shannon Miller. During our time together, I will ask Shannon a few questions to help educate us on Title IX. She will then share a personal Title IX story and wrap up by providing us a piece of evidence on how we can advocate to strengthen and secure Title IX. Let me begin by sharing her background information. Shannon Miller has had a very successful ice hockey playing and coaching career. She was the head coach of the Canadian National Women's Hockey Team, which claimed gold at the 1997 IIHF World Women's Championship, along with the silver medal in ice hockey at the 1998 Winter Olympics. Most notably, Shannon served as the first ever head women's ice hockey coach for the University of Minnesota at Duluth. During her 16 years at Minnesota, during 1999 to 2015, she won five national championships, compiled over 380 wins, received coach of the year honors, and so much more. With this impressive coaching career, Shannon became the most successful female ice hockey coach of all time. In September of 2015, Shannon, along with two other former University of Minnesota coaches, fi filed a Title IX suit against the University Board of Regents, alleging discrimination. Shannon will dive more into this lawsuit and the results during our conversation today. Shannon, thank you for joining me today to discuss Title IX. Well, thank you for inviting me, Kathy. And I must say, I'm very impressed with your Educate and Advocate program and just really be, I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you, thank you. My first question, help me understand this. You are the winningest coach in college ice hockey history. How does an institution let someone with your success go? Yeah, it's pretty mind blowing, um, hard to believe. So. A new chancellor came into the university, uh, not the chancellor that had started women's hockey and hired me. A new athletic director came in and um, they, they just cut and cut and cut our budget drastically. They had no respect for women's hockey, obviously no respect for Title IX, no respect for the history of our program whatsoever. And what was interesting is during the federal lawsuit that we launched against the university, there's a phase called discovery. And in this discovery period, you have to turn over all the documents and emails and conversations that go on. And when there was an email that we discovered, this new athletic director had emailed HR and said, I want to get rid of these six women. How do I do it? And the six women he identified were the six openly gay women in the athletic department. No other women, no, no men, nobody else. Um, so that that tells you right there what his intention was, and you'll never, ever be able to disprove that because that's the reality of the situation. It didn't matter how successful we were, how well loved we were by the community, he was getting rid of these six openly gay women. And that pretty much sets the table for the rest of the story. Wow, that's just absolutely unbelievable. So my, my second question, throughout your very, very successful career at University of Minnesota, you were dealing with several gender inequities and violations of Title IX. Uh, please share with us a few of those inequities um, specifically related to salary, uh, recruiting budget, personnel and staff, and anything else you'd like to tell us about. Yeah, for sure. Um, so before I go through the inequities, um, I'm just going to give you a really quick synopsis of the head coach of the men's team. He was there for the same period of time I was. So it's a really easy comparison. We both started approximately the same time and were there for approximately 15 years. And so before I dive into the inequities, I'll just give you an idea of, um, I, and I'm reading from Donna Lopiano's report so I get the facts straight. She's the Title IX expert uh, at our federal trial. Coach Miller had seven frozen four appearances in 15 years compared to the men's head coach who only had two. Coach Miller uh, had 10 NCAA tournament berths compared to the men's head coach who only had five. And then she goes on to say, it's simply an incredible record for a coach who in 10 of 15 years qualifies for the NCAA tournament, 
-hmm. that's the top eight in the mm -hmm. nation, and then advance to the frozen four in seven of those 10 opportunities. And so me and my team advanced to the frozen four seven times. And out of those seven times that we advanced, we won five national championships. So we've been to the White House to be honored by the President of the United States five times. Um, mm -hmm. There's maybe three programs in all sport, men's and women's, three or four that could say that in all sport, all sports. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you an idea of the comparison between myself and the men's head coach. And though, and even though that we were so much more successful than the men's team, they of course were not in compliance with Title IX, which is why I'm your guest here today. And just to touch on a few of them, Kathy, um, mm -hmm. For example, recruiting, you mentioned that's a big one always. So our men's program would get anywhere from say 55,000 to $75,000 a year to recruit. An average woman's team would get between 50 and 70,000. So our men's program was just above the average women's team in the country. Our program consistently from the beginning until the time that we were fired, we averaged anywhere from 26,000 to $35,000. Oh so we were half, yeah, we were half of what the men were getting and significantly lower than most division one programs across the country, but we still did so well, obviously with recruiting and winning. So we didn't let that slow us down, but it was definitely a title nine inequity. To bring up another one, um, so travel and daily allowance, for example, and why does travel matter? Well, it really does matter if you're an athlete and a coach and you know that mm -hmm. traveling the day before a big game or the day before a big event versus the day of um, they mm -hmm. were given better treatment in that area than we were. Also, NCAA play, we all want to travel and play teams. For example, I was in the Western um, mm -hmm. Conference, so we want to travel and play teams in the Eastern Conference because it helps your NCAA ranking and helps you qualify for the postseason NCAA play. Mm -hmm. And so we were only allowed to make one trip out east a year where our men's team was allowed to make two. So that, you know, it just doubles their chances of getting a good grade to be ranked. Mm -hmm. But having said that, we still outperformed our men's team. Uh, I'll just give you one more example, even though there's so many, I could give you something simple like um, publicity and promotion. As women, we hear all the time, well, the reason that men get paid more than the women is because they get so many more fans at their games. Well, one of the things we presented during our trial was he was given 15 opportunities a year to go on radio and television. And I was given five opportunities a year. And it's the athletic department that sets that up. And so they spun it like, oh, he gets paid more than Shannon because he has to do so much more public, like media. He's out on TV more and he's got that pressure and Shannon only had to do it five times. Well, I would like to do it 15 times. <laughs> and so they're out there promoting the men's team, you know, minimally three times more than they're promoting our program, which is the winning program. And so just those inequities, they just pile up and it's just, it becomes one giant snowball that just never ends. Well, it's, it's you know, the, in your salary, just in your salary alone, I mean, the, the inequities that you're discussing here are just, uh, to, be, to be blunt, are mind-boggling. Um, and kudos to you and your staff for being so, for, uh, for the success you've had with the limited resources you had. So. Yeah, I, I apologize. You did ask about salary and I didn't bring it up, um, but I, I have it right here. I, I like to be specific with some facts. Understandable. Uh, and this is right from the lawsuit documents. So the year that we were fired, um, I was making $205,000 a year and the men's head coach was making 265,000. So who's making $60,000 base salary more than me, even though I was five times more successful than he was. Mm -hmm. And here's what salary, like we're supposed to, we're, we're working at academic institutions, right? Mm -hmm. So academia is supposed to, supposed to matter. The head coach of the men's team had a bachelor's degree and I had a master's degree and his contract term was typically six years. Mine was year to year. Wow. My winning percentage was over 700. His was at 500, a little under, a little over, but in general at about 500 consistently. Um, I had won four regular season conference titles. We had won five conference tournament championships. He had only won one. 
And I already told you about NCAA berths, 10 to five, seven to two for frozen four appearances, um, five national championships to one. I'd been a national team coach for seven years, three world championship gold medals, Olympic silver. He had none of that experience. So when you put it on paper and, it's, and you show it to 12 jurors, <laughs> it's pretty simple because it is really simple. <laughs> We're talking about equity here and, and comparing people. And so the comparisons uh, weren't even close, but yet a stall was still $60,000 more than mine after I had won five national championships. Wow. Well, um, Donna Lopiano has been a regular um, guest here on our campus and uh, she is the Title IX expert. So kudos again to you for, for bringing her in on this very, very important case. So my, my next question is you re repeatedly brought these dis disparities to the attention of your administrators and athletic directors, and you continuously fought for equality for your teams. Can you share with us, and you're talking about your success compared to the, the men's program, well, can you share with us their responses or their reactions when you continuously knocked on the door and said, this is wrong? Yeah, obviously you start um, with a gentle approach, you know? First, <laughs> First we won <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know, almost every female coach has a story. And then you start gently knocking on the door and you start to explain what Title IX is and the inequities and imagine how much better of an environment you can create your, for your female student athletes if they were to be treated equal to the men and how much more success you could have academically, athletically, um, personally for everybody. And the response was always, why do you need more? You're winning anyway. Mm. And I'd be like, yeah, I almost have to hospitalize myself at the end of every season. That's how hard I'm working. Um, while the men's coach, you know, I watch them go for lunch. I watch them sit around their feet up on the desk, having conversations. Um, I watch him have way more staff than I have. The staffing inequity uh, is very common where the men's program has way more staff than the women. And that was my case as well. But yeah, we still continue to do well because myself and so many others work so hard. And then you start writing letters and you start documenting it in emails. And in, in some cases I actually physically wrote a letter on the computer, printed it off and mailed it to them. Uh, I did this for the athletic director, the SWA, senior women's administrator. Mm -hmm. I did it to HR repeatedly for a few years. I went to the vice chancellor of the university repeatedly. And I was never angry. I was never crazed. I was thoughtful, professional, and factual. Mm -hmm. And I did try to educate and advocate because I love those two words that you've selected. They're key. And I really just tried to move the needle. And I just said, we can keep winning for you. We built a dynasty, but my God, you got to help us out here. And the truth is, um, it was nothing but backlash. I had already been treated poorly because I was openly gay. I was being treated poorly because we were winning and people were jealous. But the minute I started to speak up and gently push to create a better and more equal environment for my female student athletes, mm -hmm. not for myself, but for my female student athletes, and not for all of us, um, it, it, it got ignorant. Um, the senior women's administrator, I'm embarrassed to say, um, told myself, the women's track coach, the women's softball coach, and the women's basketball coach all to be quiet. Wow. Get in your office, don't ask for anything, do your work, don't, don't speak up, don't push, don't ask for anything, and literally just shut up. I mean, that's what she literally told all of us. And we didn't know this until the lawsuit, we all came together and started sharing stories. And we found out that I knew she had said that to me, but then I found out she said the softball coach, track coach, a basketball coach. I mean, I'm embarrassed for her. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, athletic directors often put women in those positions as their assistant athletic director or senior women's administrator who's supposed to help manage equity in Title IX. They put those kinds of women in there because they won't. So that was bad. A couple, uh, a lot of other things happened. Uh, HR sent me a letter basically telling me I was crazy and tried to paint me out to be a really bad picture or a, a picture of me being a bad human being and a whiner and whatever versus addressing the facts that I laid out for them. So they didn't respond professionally and appropriately for that. We use that at trial. But here's, here's a couple other things um, that might shock people. Um, one day I came into work and someone had taken my name tag off my door and they had 
put a sticky on the door and it just said dyke. Oh boy. Oh. Yeah. And on three or four other occasions when I got my mail, I had hate mail in my mailbox that said go home dyke. And some of the other stuff that was written, I'm not even going to repeat it. Um, and so it was an environment of hate towards successful women, strong women, and certainly openly gay women. And all of that was brought forward to the chancellor, the vice chancellor's HR, athletic director, senior women's administrator, as nicely and professionally as possible, but to the point where I wasn't going to let it go either. Like, come on, we're winning. We've created this dynasty. We won five national championships. You need to step up and treat us better. And that is a fight that I don't regret. I, I don't regret that at all. I don't regret the lawsuit, federal lawsuit fight that I had to go through as, as difficult as it was and draining. I don't regret fighting because we have to speak up. We have to fight or there is no change. And I don't want to be one of those women, women that just gets carried along on the current and sees all the inequities around me, but keeps them in my, my mouth shut because how proud are you going to be when you turn 70, 80, and 90, and it's too late, and you can't maybe do anything about it anymore. So we, we, you know, we, the lesbians in the athletic department, we got excluded from meetings, we got excluded from Christmas parties and other activities. Wow. And we knew it was happening, but we just said, kill them with kindness, kill them with kindness, stay on your own path, be, you know, your true north, be a good person, be a good coach, and maybe things will change. And unfortunately, <laughs> they didn't, they came to a head and right. a federal lawsuit occurred. Wow. This is an incredible story. And, and uh, I appreciate you, all that you did to support your student athletes for so many years, even under the hostile working environment that you and the others had to deal with on a daily basis. Now, I, I, if, if I recall, um, you, well, can you share with us the, the results of the lawsuit, please? Sure. So it was a federal trial. It's a federal civil rights trial. Title IX was one of the components and the biggest component at that trial. And basically, um, there, it's, a, it's a federal law with a federal judge, a federal lawsuit, federal judge, 12 jurors. And it was a two-week trial. And basically, you, you tell your side of the story and you bring your witnesses in. We had remarkable people, remarkable witnesses. They bring their witnesses in. One of them was the senior women's administrator, and she was absolutely humiliated on the stand. Oh, wow. And uh, but she, you know, she still had had a job there, and I believe she recently retired. But um, yeah, just to tell you about the lawsuit, we didn't have trouble finding witnesses. Um, we had so much evidence. The lawyers that we had had done several Title IX lawsuits before, and they said this is overwhelming the most evidence they had ever seen in a Title IX lawsuit. Donna Lupiano actually said the same thing, our Title IX expert. She said, this is overwhelming uh, evidence and very confident we were going to win. And the 12 jurors, it only took them three and a half hours after a two week trial wow. to come back wow. and say, we believe Shannon, we don't believe the athletic director and his people. And we believe Shannon and her witnesses. And yeah, I was awarded a substantial amount of money uh, for compensation and then went through what I believe to be more sexism. Um, the judge agreed with the jury and awarded me, the jury awarded me $4.2 million. The judge agreed with the verdict of I should win, but the case sat on his desk for a year and a half. They typically sit for 30 days. I had to oh wait to see what his decision would be and, and get any financial restitution from all of this. Um, he decided that it was too much money for Minnesota, but he was okay with the men's coach uh, getting the big salary and all the bonus men's coach was getting $30,000 a year bonuses. And I wasn't getting any, um, and he had a golf membership and I didn't and those kinds of things. But anyway, um, this judge decided that it was too much money. And so he cut my financial restitution to or my financial reward to $2 million. Well, just under $2 million. So I really feel like I got hit hard, you know, the first time I lost mm -hmm. my coaching career. And then I feel that this judge made a grave error in his judgment and not after, you know, it's 12 jurors and it was a trial by jury, not a trial mm -hmm. by judge. And so that's a whole nother uh, book on its own, the judge coming in and doing that and taking a year and a half for me to even 
have that decision made and then we had to go through the process of a contract and then that took another six months and so i went through this for seven years didn't have a oh job goodness. became financially strapped yep. um but we won and yep. it was a it was a it was a worthy opponent it was a hell of a fight it was a necessary fight and you can only hope that not only did i help myself and female athletes at umd because things are much better for them now mm. Um, you can only hope that you've had some small ripple effect on the world. Oh, and you have. You you, you mentioned um, your struggle that seven year time frame where you lost your professional career, your coaching career, etc. Because uh, I I don't believe you you did a short stint of coaching after Duluth. Yes. Okay. Okay. But other than that, you, beyond that very short stint. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but if you could elaborate, did you feel blackballed and experienced retaliation for speaking out? And please share these experience with us. Um, you know, that's overwhelming, that, that long yeah. journey. Yeah, it is. You know, one thing in life, right? We, we meet so many people that we're so proud of and we embrace and we're just, we're blown away and we admire and respect them so much. But we also meet people that we're just so disappointed in, right? And they really let us down. I'm really disappointed in athletic directors and, and presidents of universities. When when I called an attorney and well, I ended up calling and interviewing four or five attorneys and then picking one firm, he said to me, I just want you to understand something. If you file a lawsuit, he goes, which I quite, <laughs> I'm quite sure you're going to win. He goes, you'll never coach again. And mm -hmm. I said, well, why is that? And he said, because you're suing your employer your former employer and he said it's just the way it is and i said no way there's no way i said i'll be coaching in two or three years i'll win my lawsuit and i'll be coaching and he said i'm just telling you that's not how it works so i had to have a, a moment you know to really reflect and i had to talk to with my partner and my partner at that time was and at, and now presently was the head softball coach she was the head softball coach at umd she was also fired she was on that list of six people of openly gay women um, she was the head softball coach. So we were going through this together. It wasn't just one of us lost our job. We both lost our jobs. Mm. Um, and it was, we had to really talk about this. Like, how do you walk away from this and not fight back? But but this lawyer's telling us if we do sue, then we're going to lose our coaching careers, which neither one of us wanted to do. And we, but then we decided you can't, you can't put up with something like this. You you have to fight back for yourself, for the young women that are mm -hmm. watching you. Like, you know, I was coaching 25 young women. I'm their mentor. They are watching what I'm going to do. And so we, we agreed that it's unfortunate if athletic directors and presidents are really that uh, inept and that they they would not take a look at the situation and see that the university was wrong and and maybe pick up these coaches and give them a, a you know a, a new life but nobody did so my lawyer was right wow. and uh yeah the thing in canada was nothing it, it was absolutely a mistake it was like walking into quicksand i had it was a thirty thousand dollar coaching job i did it for a friend as a favor and it was a it was a ship that was already sinking so i was only there a few months and i left so mm -hmm it's that wasn't a real coaching opportunity so I, I truly haven't had one and it's heartbreaking and it always will be always yeah. well you definitely sacrificed a lot um for what you went through there and um you know i'm, I'm just going to switch gears a little bit you know we're talking about coaching and um you know you're the the first ever women's coach of the ice hockey team um but according to the Tucker Center, in, in, 1990, in 1971, there were 90% of all collegiate teams were coached by women. And as of you know, uh, 20, 2021, that number decreased as low as 40%. Um, what do you attribute to the significant decline in women coaches? And how do you think we can increase the, that percentage? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, Title IX encouraged more participation and allowed more participation of females in sport, girls and women in sport. So as we participated more and women's sport became more popular and more competitive and more well-known, mm -hmm. then men were more interested now in coaching women's sports. And salaries obviously went up 
-hmm. and more men were hired. And then as the salaries increased, the more interest came in from men um, because of the, yeah, the prominence of women in sport now and the salaries. And so it's athletic directors that are doing the hiring mm -hmm. and athletic directors are overwhelmingly men and they are hiring overwhelmingly numbers of men to coach women in sport. And what's crazy to me is I, I, cause I just see through the lens of you're a human being, I'm a human being, everyone's equal. I mean, I literally see through that lens. I don't see through a straw that says, oh, men can coach women. Of course they can, but well, can women coach men? Well, no, of mm -hmm. course they can. I mean, it's just, it's crazy to me. I'll just never understand it. So we do need to find more guys that are he for she, right? We've all heard that term he for she. Mm -hmm. So we need to help educate the men in our lives. And we have to look for more men that are he for she. And if we can find those people and get them into positions of responsibility where they hire and they hire more women, and then if the women do their due diligence and hire more women, it's the only way it's going to change. But right now, the good old boys club is alive and well. This is not from 50 years ago. It's today. Yeah, unfortunately, I do, do hope that number increases. Uh, it's, it's important for girls uh, to have the role, women, female role models. So I, I have something funny to tell you before we move on about that. Sure. So I'm talking to um, a woman who's in a prominent position, let's say, to help women get jobs as athletic directors. And I'm talking to her over the phone and I sent her my resume. And I mean, you, you have to remember, I was the first woman in the world to head coach an Olympic hockey team. Mm. And then we've already, you know, talked about three world championships, Olympics all that stuff, master's degree. And she says to me, well, the problem is, you know, you're really not qualified to be an athletic director. And I burst out laughing and I said, are you kidding me? And I said, let me list the three athletic directors that I had at the University of Minnesota Duluth, including the one that fired me. And I rattled off their non-qualifications. Wow. And it was absolutely mind blowing to me that this woman would say that to me. They, every athletic director I've had, I've had one really good one and two just horrible ones they none of their resumes and experience education whatever would stack up with mine and so it was just such a strange response from a woman mm. who's in a leadership role to help women become athletic directors i was stunned yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, they're definitely not helping the problem helping the, the cause yeah so um my last my last question on the education side of the house is how does Title IX affect society today, in your, your opinion? Well, Title IX is a federal law, and we all should be fighting for civil rights, right? It's, it's a civil right. And as you know, it was passed back in 1972. And so as a society, I feel like Title IX is um, directed at education and activities, as you know, mm -hmm. and sport is part of those activities. But the reality is Title IX is simply about equality. And so it should spill over and bleed into society in our day-to-day -day life. And I think if more and more people understand Title IX and that it is a federal law that was passed and there's only good about it, I mean, just there's nothing bad about it. Right. Every institution should be following the federal law of Title IX. And mm -hmm. it should, like I said, um, spill in over into society where we just treat people equally whether it's little league baseball and girls softball or how we treat our neighbors to mm -hmm. educational opportunities. We provide our sons and daughters, the scholarships, grants, just everything. It's day-to-day -day behavior. And in society, if we can just see each other as human beings, we all bleed red blood and treat each other with equality. Boy, wouldn't the world just be a much better place. Yeah. As someone has once said to me fairly recently is it's, it's a common sense law. Uh, you know, it's common sense. So thank yeah. you. Uh, Shannon, do you want to share another um, impact? I mean, the one you just shared was just absolutely overwhelming, but is there another impactful personal Title IX story that you'd like to share? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll do um, two, two kind of quick ones. Is that sure. okay with you? Absolutely. Um, one, I just want to mention, because um, this is related, obviously, to Title IX, is when when he, the athletic director and president of the university called me in to fire me, we're in the middle of our season. And this just blows people's oh. minds. 
we were ranked six in the country out of 34 teams. We had just won 12 out of our last 13 games. This is division one, wow. winning 12 of your last 13 games, being ranked six in the country. And when they called me in and fired me in the middle of the season, we had just come home from a road trip sweeping Ohio State. Imagine the resources they have compared oh to us. Gosh. And their reason, we can't afford you anymore. You're the highest paid coach in the country. We can't afford you. And I laughed and said, I'm the highest paid coach in the country because I'm the winningest coach. Oh. The men's coach is still making way more money than me, but you're going to fire me. Right. I mean, wow. it was crazy. So that's a, that's a title nine kind of funny story. That's not so funny, but one that involves other sports and other people I'd like to share with you. Sure. So I, I want to just clarify this. My partner right now used to be the head coach of the softball team. But the story I'm about to tell you, we barely knew each other. We were not partners. So the head coach of the softball team comes over to my house one day to talk to me about treatment, hmm. how she's being treated, her team, herself, the environment. And she's asking me to advocate for her. And then we're in this middle of this great conversation. She says, oh my gosh, she goes, I have to go. I have to go. I have to go put up the fencing or no, I have to go put the I don't even know what it's, it is, but it's these rubber things along the top of the fence all around mm. the softball field so that mm. the players don't hurt themselves if they're diving mm. to catch a ball or whatever. And I said, well, who's doing it with you? And she said, nobody. And they, they were wow. hosting games the next day. And she said, I have to go put up this fencing. It's going to take me several hours. I have to go. I said, nobody's going with you. And she said, no. And I said, well, then I'm going to go with you and help. And she said, oh my God, no, you're, you're the division one coach. You shouldn't be doing this. And I said, no, somebody should be helping you. I'm going to help you. I went and helped her. And on Monday morning, the first thing on my list, because you talk about advocating and educating and mm -hmm. we have to have action, right, Kathy? We can't just right. talk about it. So action, I go into the athletic director's office first thing Monday morning, pleasant. Okay. And I say to the athletic director, hey, the women's hockey team, the women's soccer team, the women's softball team, we all have been asked to volunteer and work at all the football games. Mm. This, this guy's the athletic director and the football coach. Yeah. And I say to him, right, isn't that right? He's like, yeah. I said, okay. So I want to know something. Why aren't the football players doing anything for the women's hockey team, the women's soccer team, or the women's softball team to return the favor? And he just stared at me with a blank stare. And I said, I'll just give you an example, Bob. And I told him about what I did on my Friday afternoon from, you know, five to seven or 8 p.m. And to help Jen Van for the softball coach. And he literally had nothing to say to me. And I oh said, Bob, goodness. please wow. assign some football players to help at different events the same way we're helping the men at different events. And here's just one example. Oh, my goodness. Well, it never happened. It never changed. And then they started treating her even worse because she had spoke up to me up. So, yeah oh my goodness that's unbelievable yeah that's a, you know um you know i coached 20 years here and um and and i can say i fortunate that i don't think i i have a comparable story on that end i've never had to do that and uh, I'm, I'm sorry that jen had to go through that um yeah another another inequity for sure yeah, yeah. and the blank yeah. stairs are just mind blowing, aren't they? It, yes. It, yes. It's like, uh, yes. <laughs> you're like, could you speak? Like say something and they don't, they don't speak. They don't do anything. I mean, it's just nothing. It's crazy. Well, well I just have uh, one more uh, statement or question to ask you um, to, to wrap things up is, can you provide one piece of, of, of advice? And you have been along the way, but one piece of advice to advocate for Title IX um, that would be appreciative. Yes, if every male and female just looked around in, in, in their environment, whether it be at work, in society, um, at an academic institution, in the sports world, if you just take a moment to look around and really be honest with yourself, are things equitable? And the answer is going to be no, they're not. And so think of one thing that maybe you could do to help. And again, it's he for she. We need um, mm -hmm. boys and men on our side fighting for equality. And there has to be boys and men out there that believe in equality. Of course there are. And so if each one of us just literally just looks around, be honest with yourself, 
find an inequity and then move forward to help create that change, even if it doesn't affect you that much, because in the end, of course it does, because when you lift others up, they will lift you up and it lifts mm -hmm. up society. So just, if you just take one small step of action, you know, and have success doing it, you'll feel really good about it. Then you'll take another small step. And that's the only way this whole society is going to move forward. Yeah. Great, great advice. Yes. Keep moving, moving forward, baby steps and hopefully giant steps. And then we're running. Yeah. Keep running forward. Thank you. Well, Shannon, this is, um, I've enjoyed my time talking with you. Uh, and thank you for sharing your incredible story, your journey for fighting against discrimination and for Title IX, um, it has, you have paved the way for women in sport, especially for female coaches to stand up for equal rights. Thank you, thank you. And I appreciate you taking the time to be part of my webcast and for all your efforts to educate and advocate for Title IX. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I hope I've inspired some to take yes. action and you are, what you're doing is very inspiring. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you.